I bought to myself. Good. Yes. 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 Thank you. I only wore it once. Because women, uh, when it rains, it shed, shed the rain. Is there a button to press or is it all? I think you just speak into it. You don't need to push anything. When I uh, had the raincoat on, the rain would run off, would run into my shoes, and I was slopping in the water. And, uh, it, and I was just as wet inside as outside. After all, I was in a tropical country, semi-tropical, where the humidity is high, and when I was under that raincoat, I would sweat to where I would be just as warm or sweat inside as outside. This is designed that the airflow will go through here, and it keeps you cool in a raincoat. So uh, it's very comfortable if you're a working man in the rice field. Otherwise, uh, uh, umbrella is much more preferable. This umbrella is made with bamboo, and this is uh, uh, oil paper, and uh, they will last a long time. And, uh, this one, this one, of course, is already, uh, I haven't used it that much, but it's over 60 years old. And uh, so, but the mountain people where I worked with, they would uh, use this, they use this in the rice field. And uh, I gotta learn to use this, don't I? <laughs> and if I would use, if I would use that, I would be walking with shoes like this. The water does not collect in these shoes. And uh, they come in different sizes, and uh, the children would never saw anyone wear shoes. They start walking in those. And uh, they are able to. I was uh, contacted by my church's relief agency, the Mennonite Central Relief, they said they needed a, a 24 year old man without girlfriends. <laughs> now why, why would you need a man like that? That was a puzzle. They wanted someone for the island of Formosa, which today we know is Taiwan. And uh, I didn't find out why until I got there because we knew, I knew very little about the island. I knew it was there, it's off the coast of China. It's uh, Japan and Korea are up there, and then comes Taiwan, and then below that is the Philippines. Taiwan is, uh, this is a replica of the island. It's about 150 miles long and about 50 miles wide. Uh, the majority of the island is mountainous. The mountains, there's uh, about 60 peaks that are over 10,000 feet. Now that's crowded on an island, so that gives you quite a rubbish. And uh, now just uh, wait a moment. We go to the Rockies and we have Pikes Peak. How high is that? 14,000. But you know, we're already got a head start of a couple thousand feet till we get to the island. These 10,000 uh, peaks, they start at an island, more at the ocean level. So that's quite a rugged country. They wanted me to run uh, uh, some medical help in the, where the mountain people are. Uh, original mountain people, there is no record or when I left anyway, nobody had any guess when they come there. But there is evidence by their language and by some other things that most of them had come south from Malaysia and had migrated there. The Chinese uh, went from mainland China and they settled here and started uh, 
pushing them into the mountains. The Chinese came uh, much like uh, we Americans came to America from Europe. We were looking for freedom. We were looking for opportunities. And they came somewhere in the 1400s. In the 1600s, the Dutch come and took the island. And uh, with the Dutch, as they normally did, they sent some missionaries. And uh, when the first Presbyterian missionaries came in uh, the late 1800s, they were not aware that there had been any missionaries before. But the Dutch had started about 30 churches, a little over 30. And uh, they uh, found it, graveyards and so on that the evidence, but uh, by the 1800s there was no evidence of that. The Portuguese came and chased the Dutch out, and they named the island Formosa. In Portuguese, Formosa is beautiful. The Isle, beautiful. And I found it very much that way when uh, I did, uh, when I came there. And uh, my sunshine and I were there 25 years after, and it was not as beautiful anymore. You know, when we modernize, we get industry, we build super highways, we do this and that, and some of that originality that God put in creation has somehow been lost. And you know, we're becoming conscious of that in our own country. After the Portuguese, the Spanish occupied it for a while, and then the Japanese came in the the late 1800s. After World War II uh, was closed, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his government in China come into opposition. And uh, if you remember history from post-World War II, uh, the communists and uh, what we was spoken of at that time as the We call them terrorists today. And at that, that time, what were they called? I forgot. And, uh, he, they were chased to Taiwan. They, the government escaped for their own safety. But they were not welcome. After all, they, uh, uh, Taiwan was hoping for their independence. And it was not about to be given to them. So there was quite a bit. Guerrillas is the word that I want. You remember the word guerrillas? Post World War II, we had the guerrillas in Vietnam and and uh, China and that, more or less like our terrorists are today. So uh, the Taiwanese told me that uh, most every family lost a member in the battle, and uh, and uh, we knew really nothing about that here in America. You know how our public uh, uh, information, newscast is, we were in favor of Chiang Kai-shek. So when there was disappointing news, it was sort of overtook, taken by other news. And uh, we knew nothing of that. I knew very little. I talked to a number of world travelers that were unaware of that uh, struggle that went into media there. Well, Chiang Kai-shek was... Uh, very fearful that guerrillas from the mountains would come and chase him out again. So I was asked by the, the committee that uh, contacted me if I would be willing to run a medical service there, sort of as a, as a cushion. I was funded by the American Society for Overseas Blind out of New York. There was a lot of uh, eye problems there. These uh, Aborigines, or mountain people, they would build their fire in the hut, and for some reason, they never thought of putting an opening up on top. So those huts were just uh, uh, smoky. 
If they were a little more wealthy, they might have a hut beside them where they did their cooking. But with that hut, uh, it, so you can imagine what the shape of their eyes were with that uh, smoke and such. So uh, that was my assignment why I was there. I was there for three years. I lived with the Nationals and uh, in a home I got acquainted quite well. You know, we think of the Orientals sometimes as being backwards. I lived long enough with them that I appreciated their culture. I saw that there was merit in there and uh, family life that it enhanced and so on. And I could also see where, uh, I don't want to get too much into the politics, but uh, the place was under martial law when I got there. But my first surprise when I got there was that when I got there, they told me there are enough planes at the airfield to remove every American in one flight. Now why that? I didn't know it was that, uh, that concerned. And uh, so uh, they did, said that to try and uh, reassure me, but it, it was a little frightening to begin with until you get uh, tested and acquainted and find out it isn't that way. But uh, we needed permits. It was under martial law. We needed a permit to get in there. And uh, I was an American, and I got a permit that would let me go anywhere for six months. But for the natives, I mean for the Taiwanese that had lived there for generations, and uh, it was home to them, the best that I could do was get them one for a week or ten days to certain villages that would be named. And uh, just imagine what that did in the conflict, in the feelings. You know, uh, I heard about that. I wasn't a, a foreigner, and the government gave me that much more freedom than they gave to their own people. And that was part of the politics, why, uh, 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 why they uh, didn't appreciate the country that came in. I had about uh, 60 co-workers working part-time with me. What I did was uh, very little, but uh, I think what I made the opportunities for the 60 that were working with me, that was terrific. It gave them the incentive to do something for their people. It got them acquainted with the Aborigines, with the mountain people that had been pushed aside very, very much like our American Indians were. And it helped them to get acquainted. And uh, I felt it was a worthwhile project. I did, uh, we'll uh, follow with a movie where we'll see some of the details of the activities. I won't be quite as uh, collected as I probably was at one time, but uh, uh, very simply, they used bamboo for everything. They made their instruments with bamboo. Uh, this was a typical hoe. I never saw a hoe with a long handle. Uh, they all worked down. We uh, all had a machete, like I'm carrying. If you're if you're uh, walking in the mountains or in the, in the, on the trails, in tropical country the plants grow very rapidly and we all had a machete in our hand to keep the path trails open so that the trails would be visible and traceable in the, the time later. I would go for uh, uh, maybe a, a week or ten days and take a circle of villages where we would give uh, medical or physical help as we could. Well, let's see, what am I leaving out? Back with your pictures. <laughs> it's time for the pictures, huh? All right, well, see.
see uh, well, we'll get to this yet. School. Every school has a little box like that in front. You put a little water in there, and this is ink. You would rub that in there and uh, until you had inky water, and uh, then we would use a brush like this to uh, make those 20 letters that the Chinese write with. You know, they reminded me of uh, my chickens on the farm there. You know how they scratch? That's how their letters look. But uh, uh, they, this would be their penmanship that they would use with a brush like that. Uh, was mostly a Buddhist. This is a, a Buddhist cap, and if you go to the to the temple to ask uh, wisdom from the Buddha or the priest, he had these. If they would, uh, and he would give his prayer, and uh, and he would throw them on the table, and. Uh, if they would both fall this way, his answer was yes. If one was this way and the other the other way, he would say uh, uh, it was questionable. If they both were this way, it was definitely a no. The ladies, uh, after a while, if you want to come up and look at it, this, uh, this is very neat needlework that they did. These buttons here, during World War II, we lost a, a fighter jet in those mountains, and they stripped that jet of its aluminum, and they made all these buttons from the aluminum of that uh, fighter jet. That's a, a dress. It's a dress for a, a full-grown lady. That's about the size that they were. They're uh, all quite a bit uh, smaller. Uh, here is uh, one a little different as a, as a coat. Uh, the ladies wore uh, no underclothes, none whatsoever. And uh, occasionally, uh, the one tribe, they would uh, wear this over themselves at, at a slant like that for, for a bra. Uh, they, uh, these are made from hemp. And uh, they weaved them themselves. This was a, I think this would be a man's uh, vest. And the women would have one like this that they would tie around their waist. The guys, uh, the early guys, there was not too much of this anymore when I come. But this is also made of tree bark, like my raincoat was. It's a certain tree that, wore, that uh, grew a bark with... Uh, uh, that was rain resistant and shed the rain and uh, this is a tree string. I never wore them and uh, I was going to try it but I've forgotten how to tie them. <laughs> and uh, you remember in Bible in Genesis where uh, Jacob made a, a colorful coat for Joseph? I saw a uh, uh, four or five of those coats. And uh, I have one of these. Whether this is exactly like Joseph got, I don't, I don't know, but this is what was uh, they gave. And uh, my uh, national friends, they negotiated for it. I almost felt guilty about it. I, uh, I very much wanted to bring a sample home. This was... Uh, a wife made was had cancer, and uh, she was about to die, and she had spent a whole year making this beforehand <coughs> to give to her husband, so that he would not forget her love for him. And uh, it's almost a shame and guilty that uh, I end up with the coat. Not right. And uh, okay. Uh, I think we're uh, ready after uh, about time. We'll uh, show some video, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, 
Sean come up after a while and ask me, try out my memory after all, it's been over 60 years now, what do I remember? Will you know the difference? Uh, I did not say that the Seventh Fleet of the Navy was patrolling the straits between uh, Formosa and mainland China to keep the two apart. And I feel that, uh, I sure didn't do it myself, but uh, building the relationship, I think, had a small part that Taiwan never experienced what we experienced in Korea and uh, Vietnam. Uh, to build that relationship. I uh, firmly believe that. Okay, good morning. I'm in uh, our home there. Uh, it was a two-bedroom home. That is not a garage. That's the entryway. We take our shoes off when we come in, and just at the far end was our kitchen. And uh, the kitchen is without appliances. There was a, a sink there, and we had a little what we call a hibachi, where we had uh, charcoal uh, uh, coals in there. Had a cook that uh, cooked for me, and she traveled with me also. So, it's a nice morning. The clouds are over the mountains. The fishing boats are coming in from the night of fishing out on that the thing out in front. They would, uh, a fisherman would be there with a spear and spearing fish. They're coming into, uh, by the lighthouse, coming into the harbor and, uh, and uh, apparently there's a hurricane or a typhoon out to sea because the waves are coming in quite strongly. Well, come with me. We'll take a little walk this morning to uh, town before we get to the villages. We. Uh, take off and I'm on my way to the hospital where the ambulance is parked. We go through the marketplace and uh, I uh, find my way through there with a bicycle without running anyone down. We, uh, the meat market is open. Uh, nothing is uh, prepared beforehand. It's butchered that morning and, uh, and the farmer's market is out on the street. A uh, place like this, they're uh, serving breakfast. It's, uh, Soybean milk and uh, such, and when an American come, uh, it usually would excite them. And uh, you know what we used to think of DDT? You remember that? You remember DDT? That was uh, eliminated for. Uh, well, uh, when I showed up at the bench, he took that uh, fly sprayer, you know, and he sprayed over the whole table. He was showing to, showing me that uh, he was. Uh, and keeping it free of flies and uh, sanitation. However, I, uh, I frequented these places. It was a matter of relationship. Early in the morning, the ladies are in the sewer. Uh, we had open sewers. That's, this is in the villages, and they were washing the clothes. This is downtown of uh, the capital city at that time. This is the main highway through town of the capital city, and you see they have in the center for traffic and on both sides is uh, for the bicycles, pedicabs, what you see, for the freight, and uh, that took up most of the traffic. This is charcoal in those baskets. You might run into a, a celebration that the Buddhists were uh, running, and uh, and they would have their uh, activities, what they were, and uh, the tables would be set the length of the street with uh, various food being uh, offered and eaten on the barrels and there. And here, uh, they're burning uh, paper money uh, as an offering or a sacrifice. This is another Buddhist procession. Uh, the pr priest was up in the pedicab, and these are all following. They had uh, many activities as uh, we have, even to the degree like uh, daily vacation Bible school. And this was an advertisement for them 
that inviting them to come to their uh, place of worship and uh, participate in their worship. They would have the stand set up, a platform, uh, opposite their, uh, the, the temple, and they would be performing uh, pantomiming uh, their messages that they had, and uh, in between that and the temple would be a congregation of people. The Buddhist priests were in there, and uh, food was set up on the table before there that the uh, people had brought to be dedicated to. Finally, we get there. We uh, get to the hospital, and we uh, load up what we have to take. I had a Dodge four-wheel power wagon, and away will we go. And let's see what we find along the way. This is, uh, when I was there, this was the road to the airport. It was a dirt or uh, probably a little gravel on it on a, on a road. When Irene and I went back in 1940, this was a four-lane highway. That was the 1980. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, we might see a farmer going, uh, uh, leaving his uh, farm, going uh, to the rice paddy. The boys enjoy riding their uh, buffalo. The Japanese had set up train tracks, and uh, the trains were just a little above a toy. We had tracks 18 inches apart where they would bring the sugar cane in. Those little tracks would bring uh, the dirt from a suitable place where they would take the dirt and make uh, pottery out of that, or a uh, lumberman would bring back uh, a big log. A farmer is carrying his plow, just the uh, farmer does now with a tractor. He carries the plow behind. He plows the field. It took some, takes him uh, days to uh, plow an acre. Now they plow an acre in, uh, in minutes with our large tractors. After plowing it, they go through with uh, tines or various implements to break up the clods. These uh, uh, paddies were all irrigated from the mountains. And uh, here they come with a roller to make mush out of it and prepare the field. The rice has been planted in nursery boxes. They bring those boxes to the field and uh, plant and plant them. After they are planted, they uh, need to be the, the rice fields needs to be sterilized, the weeds eliminated. They're all day on their hands and knees in that water. They were already behind the buffalo. Imagine what their hands and feet are like at the time of harvest. They're uh, uh, cut it, and uh, you see their threshing machine. They pedal it with their feet to uh, turn the cylinder and uh, thresh the rice out of the bundles that the man ties after it's cut. And uh, when they see that uh, I was on, uh, I was taking pictures. That, of course, induced them to speed up quite, a, quite rapidly and really show the Americans how hard they worked. There's a little box below that uh, collects the rice as it comes. It comes with the chaff and all as the cylinder uh, draws it out of the straw. In the southern part of the island, they used uh, this type of a threshing machine, just a grate, where they would uh, throw it over after harvesting season. Uh, to our dismay, they uh, load up the wheat and uh, take it uh, and have it, uh, what do you call it, hauled? That's not the word, but polished. And uh, I thought they took a lot of their protein and edible uh, energy out of it. Here he's uh, threshing out soybeans. 
Well, that has uh, been those first couple of miles till they got to the mountains. Now they crossed the stream on a suspension bridge. The pastor uh, uses a hammer to hammer on the bell there. Usually we set up uh, our shop at the a church if it was. If not, we would set it up at school. And uh, of course the curiosity brought the village people out and I would say normally 98% of the village would turn out. We would have a little opening exercise where uh, we would give some Bible stories. I had our chaplain along that uh, would uh, tell the Bible stories and uh, later on the doctor would uh, give some health classes of uh, what they could do to improve their health. And then we'd set up clinic. The doctor would uh, see the patients and of course everybody has a complaint. We all do too, don't we? And we all expect some medicine and our pharmacist he would uh, dispense the medicine to, according to that. I had some uh, Lutheran sister from the sisterhood of a Lutheran organization. They uh, had dentists and they would uh, set up uh, and do some dental work. Well, we'll proceed to the next uh, village. We uh, have to probably ford uh, a stream by then after the first entrance. Uh, there usually was no bridge left anymore. We uh, go through the bush and uh, uh, the roads as far as we can find ourselves. Every once in a while I'd have to uh, organize a, a crew to uh, uh, do a little road construction. If you watch closely here, uh, uh, there all the truck is bouncing and all four wheels are spinning. Uh, they had a lot of confidence and uh, the GIs have already uh, uh, showed them they could drive anywhere with the Jeep. So it was no question I could too whether the road was acceptable or not. When the streams were higher, we uh, the engines at that time still had the distributor there so we wrapped the engine in, in a, a rubber blanket to keep it dry so that we could drive through the deeper water. That's probably as far as we can go. And uh, usually from uh, there in the village at the foot of the mountains there would already be a church. I would uh, get some young people from the church to come along and uh, carry our medicines, our sleeping bags, our luggage, whatever we had and we'd uh, jump off into the mountains. Landslides were very common that we had to transfer, walk across. There would be some footbridges yet that they were missing. We would uh, ford the stream, uh, walk through it, hope that it uh, uh, wouldn't be too strong. The dry season, we would walk on the sand, of course. Uh, we would uh, walk for several hours, take a 10 minute break. 10 minutes was the limit. We had uh, uh, rice uh, balls, like uh, popcorn balls, that we took along for energy. We were up in the mountains, the water was cool and clear. We could stop for a drink and uh, we continue on our way. There's the village down there. We finally arrived at the far village and there's the schoolhouse. We're going to set up at the, at the schoolhouse. So uh, we go through the routine again. The chaplain has a small topic and if there is a church, some villages had churches and some did not. That's a typical view of the village with a, if uh, the village had an ox cart, we would uh, use that for a stage. The, in 
the mountain villages, I never saw a vehicle besides my truck. Never saw a car or any vehicle. And it was, uh, here we're uh, going through the line again, giving the medications, and uh, this baby was uh, all covered with implantigo, and uh, we give him the care that, uh, that we can. Uh, this is rather dark. It's myself uh, giving the uh, oral medicine. Everybody had worms, they, uh, and uh, they, uh, the next morning would be interesting conversation. They all go into the bush or into the grass to do their business, and uh, I don't know how accurate the counts were, but I heard counts of over 30 roundworms that uh, were in the stool the next morning. and. Uh, why didn't they feel better? What I said before the truck, they, I saw no vehicles. You know, it was interesting to see 30-year-old uh, uh, guys get into my truck and bounce around. You know how we kids, when we were in grade school, we'd get into the car and imagine. And uh, no, they, they, they were adults and they had never gotten into a seat of a vehicle. And uh, that was uh, fun. Ichinichi hai ko. Drink it very, very quickly. Because if you didn't drink that medicine quickly, it was bitter. The Lutheran <coughs> sisters were along with us again, and uh, they followed us at most places, and they had this portable thing. She's standing on one foot and pedaling with another and uh, grinding out to, for a filling. Here I'm uh, treating some with antibiotics on their eyes and uh, how would you like your dentist standing on one foot and pedaling that machine to uh, work in your mouth? We had uh, three uh, eye clinics where uh, you could go for surgery, you see the tattoos. Certain tribes, uh, the women uh, were tattooed and you knew they were taken, they were married. You leave them alone. Uh, the Japanese didn't appreciate the tattoos and they uh, pretty much eliminated it. This is uh, the nurse and my cook that are, uh, they did our laundry on the trip. They'd go down to the stream and uh, wash the rocks teased them about rocks would be cleaner than our clothes were after they uh, washed them there. And, uh, and in the morning we got to that same stream in the cold water to put the shaving cream on and we took our uh, shaves there. Our uh, faces toughened up to that. Here's uh, my uh, cook. You see on the ground floor, there's uh, what we call hibachis, where there was uh, uh, charcoal in there. Uh, we had that on the trip. That was in our home. That was our cook stove in the house where I lived. And she uh, prepared uh, the meals for me. Uh, some of us are strange. You ask uh, the waitresses what we are like at the dining room table. And, uh, you know, we all want to save face, and when we're in the mountains, they can't raise rice there, and so they raise potatoes. Well, potatoes was a poor man's food. And, uh, you know, she wouldn't dare to prepare a potato for me, because in the face of the people that would see what she was preparing for a meal, uh, it would be too embarrassing that for an American, you would prepare a potato. By all means, you'd uh, bring in some rice and give him some good food. But uh, she knew I liked potatoes. So uh, I would know when the bowl of rice would come, if I would dig way in there. She had hidden a potato for me quite often. So uh, uh, 
And uh, eating, living with them, it made me no difference whether I used chopsticks or silverware. I was as comfortable with one as with the other. They grind their feed with, or food this way. I think this was millet there. It's uh, corn is drying up on the roof. They winnow it that way. Uh, so they get the flour, and uh, of course, this is a wedding uh, uh, setting in front is the matchmaker that lined up the, uh, the couple. It's their furniture, they're going to their house. The bride is coming in the back in that black casket. That's where the bride gets to uh, travel to the new house. Okay, it's time I guess we uh, leave and uh, go to the next village, and so we start off again, if there's a, a, a cart and a buffalo available, we'll load up and uh, save the hard work. We've had rain in between, so uh, we've got to uh, find a boat to take us across the stream. In the meantime, I've gone around the mountain the other way with one of my helpers and brought the truck there to uh, pick up the crew. And we go back home and uh, to the hospital, which is uh, home base for me. This is the road in town. That's how you get there. Our Dr. Brown is our resident physician from uh, the States. He's, uh, uh, does our operating. And uh, you might uh, run into some pretty infected uh, uh, situations. The better, the larger the and the, the syringe, and the longer the needle, the more it's going to help. So you give them a full dose. The pharmacist uh, hands out the medication as the patients leave. We had uh, a nurse, head nurse, came from Canada. She's uh, teaching uh, Native uh, uh, Mountain or Aborigine girls. This was our Christmas picnic. Beautiful country. We had to go out of town and find an isolated place so uh, we wouldn't have people around us and we had our Christmas picnic. In between trips, I had to keep the thing going. There were no auto dealerships or uh, garages. It was up to me to find a problem and uh, keep the thing running, to keep it repaired. Another project that I had uh, in between uh, trips, uh, I had quite a bit of powdered milk that was surplus from the U.S. dairy. And they sent us uh, surplus powdered milk. Of course, when we showed up, uh, they were all game to come and uh, give us a hand. Those were 250-pound barrels of uh, powdered sugar. And uh, the one who was designated to be in charge, I'd give them the directions, what to expect, to uh, keep uh, records. That was uh, part of the reason for me being there with the... Uh, uh, Foundation for Overseas Blind. I think they wanted a, an American to there to oversee the funds that they were used for what they were intended to be used and not uh, squandered on uh, everything, uh, something else. Uh, one who was in charge of a milk station, I had over 30 of them going. They needed to uh, boil the water every morning, mix the milk, and the children from the village, and they would all come. They each brought a, a bowl or a glass, and they uh, got their milk every morning. It uh, was something that was unknown to them, and was uh, we felt good nutrition for them.
we went to an offshore island, just a couple miles offshore. There, uh, they were more, uh, probably more primitive yet. They had nothing in their homes. We had used Christmas cards, and uh, we gave them. And uh, you know, uh, they were afraid to have run out of Christmas cards, so uh, that got uh, quite hectic sometimes. We had them uh, registered. They all had identification. To this place, we mean they were offshore. There was no store. So uh, uh, cloth was hard to come by for them. So uh, we had several yards of cloth that we made available. Uh, the U.S. Agricultural Department also uh, made foodstuffs available. Uh, we uh, described what there was. We, uh, we had various items in there, and we bowed our heads and thanked the Lord for that. We had uh, told them how to prepare it, because uh, how do they prepare American food? They had never had any any of that, and uh, maybe they used some use, but they, butter, for example, they would have that uh, traded off, and by the Next morning, you'd see it in the store for a penny or a nickel a pound. So uh, I checked that everything was in order. This lady is unpacking the package and uh, excited about what she all got. We picked uh, villages that were needed. Uh, farmers in Kansas sent us uh, a carload of wheat flour, a whole wheat flour. We picked uh, villages that were short on protein in their diet, and uh, we brought them the whole wheat flour so that they could make whole wheat uh, bread or pastries, whatever they would, and uh, enhance their uh, protein. When we were ready to leave, many of the villagers would give us a thank you dance after it, a line dance like this. Uh, it was their way of saying thank you. Different uh, tribes have different costumes. And, uh, this was the Amish tribe, and uh, they would sing their songs, and uh, they're doing these pantomimes. They're, uh, they're washing dishes or clothes or uh, doing household chores and uh, singing uh, a lyric that, or a folk lyric that goes with them as they uh, are doing that. When uh, Irene and I were back in 1980, they were doing this in air-conditioned tents. This was another tribe closer to the uh, plateau. I guess uh, she had been to the movies, and uh, she thought I needed a little more excitement in the dance than their traditional dancing. So uh, it was uh, special for me. She thought it was. village we came up to, they were having a, a, a wedding dance. Now the dresses that they use, I, I have one on the table there if you would care to come. This, that was the bride and all these uh, 20 girls or whatever are following there, they were all bridesmaids celebrating with the marriage for the, for the girl. They would dance through the night. This was the village offshore. Their uh, pantomime, their music was different. After all, they had nothing. There was no radio or anything like that. So uh, their music sounded like the ocean waves 
the wind blowing into the trees, uh, it mimicked that very, very much so, rather than a, a cultural uh, uh, music pattern. They uh, lived out on the stilts, out in the open, where uh, it was uh, comfortable, after all it was warm. Fishermen uh, uh, pulling, uh, taking, loading their nets and uh, going out to fish in one of their uh, uh, hand-hewn boats. Fish was a good part of their diet if they were on that island. I spent two years in the mountains. The third year, not quite as much. I uh, traveled uh, back uh, to the capital city where we had our offices. Uh, there were only two ways across the mountains at each end. There was no uh, going through the mountains. There was no road. Uh, some of my stuff has disappeared. There was an abacus one time in the suitcase, and uh, they were very up to it. And uh, it was my responsibility to do the bookkeeping, to uh, get some of the things through customs that we needed for, uh, for our use, to uh, keep track of our money. Mine. See how they handled our money? The largest unit of currency was worth 25 cents in our money. So just imagine if you go and make a purchase. If your largest unit of currency was 25 cents. The third year that I was there, the mission board was, it was being transferred to them. And uh, here was a dedication of the church in uh, one of the plains. We did not establish churches in the mountains. Those were all Presbyterian churches. One of my co-workers at the, the wedding, and they uh, were trying to imitate our American wedding with a cake. Most churches had kindergartens. That they uh, it was part of their ministry, and it was a, a worthwhile ministry. And of course, there were lots of people there. We had. Uh, a baby's home where we had orphans till they were three years old. And uh, if I had free time between the trips, I often went there and uh, played with the kids. They enjoyed having the attention. Uh, another uh, children's project is coming up that funded us. We built a, a campus for them with uh, uh, family group homes and a chapel. It comes up in just a moment. There's the chapel and uh, the various homes. It was uh, very nicely built. It was a donation from a foundation that we used and uh, had uh, chapel services every morning. Our, uh, our director there was the former FBI chief in China. We had quality men that were available to join us and work with us. And I appreciated that very much. Drying peanuts. They need to be spread out during the day and uh, sacked up. One of the boys has been learning how to uh, farm by running the buffalo. They had a garden that they watered to uh, supply for themselves. Instead of dogs, monkeys make good pets, very good pets. You'd be interested. So, that was my three years. I enjoyed them. They're going out of view. And thank you for coming. And uh, if you uh, care to, you can come and uh, just... Uh, you a little bit what you like. Thank you for coming.
enjoy to review what I felt were a good time in my life. Yeah, it was great. I was Thanks for sharing. That. And uh, it says, and uh, by all means, the first year after I retired, I took my sunshine along. The first winter after we retired, I spent in Panama. And uh, that dress uh, was made by one of the Indians there. And uh, if you're interested, take a close up look at it, at the stitching, the very fine stitching that there is. Remarkably, what they did. Okay, thank you for coming. Great, thank you. So here are the first of many, we hope. We hope to share everyone that might have an interest in sharing your story. We, we hope that we can do this with other people. So Harold was our first brave, ex, ex, I don't know what you call it, but he, he approached me and he asked if, if we might want to hear his story. And I said yes, and I encourage anyone else that wants to tell their story, to of, um, just let me know. Of a Buddhist God, you do and it doesn't this. have to be as world no. traveler as a uh, Harold, no. but and if they fall this way, that'll be a tough act. Yes. I know it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're gonna yeah. have bingo. So yeah, it's on the, it's on the cap like this. I can have to. Uh, we'll. So he looks